We finally got the Fantax Evolve X to review, and while it is not the perfect case, no case really is, it's pretty interesting. Fantax does a lot of different things with this one. They have, for example, a top-mounted ITX bracket that you can buy separately that is then powered in a split system setup with a single power supply. So Fantax gets credit for doing something different and unique. Fantax also does some things that we've seen in the past and didn't necessarily like, and we'll walk through all that through this system as well. Some examples are shown here to be discussed momentarily. The case is about $200 standalone. It's about $465 if you buy it with the power supply and with the sheet of metal that adapts the mini ITX system to the top of the case. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Rock 4 and Dark Rock Pro 4 CPU coolers. These high-end coolers focus on a smarter approach to air cooling by adding a mini fin stack on top of the direct contact cold plate, adding small bumps to the fins for increased service area, and by using Silent Wayne's 135mm fans, custom built for high performance cooling without too much noise. The Pro is a dual tower cooler rated for 250W TDP, while the Dark Rock 4 is built for 200W TDPs. Learn more at the link in the description below. So this is on loan from Chris, one of our viewers, and thank you, Chris, to, for sending this. We really appreciate it because we didn't get one, and they were kind of hard to get. It's a really popular case, apparently, uh, or the quantity is low, or a bit of both. So Fantex absolutely has driven interest with this case, and there's not a ton of availability out there to just, to just pick one up. This one was a combo unit. So this was $465 for the case and the combo 80 plus platinum power supply. It's a Seasonic foundation power supply that splits. So you can power a bottom system, a top system. There's a separate power button for both. And if you wanted a streaming system built inside of the case with a main system for gaming, and then one captures the other, you can do that. It's a bit convoluted. We talk about that through Patrick's build notes later, but it's absolutely doable. And that's pretty interesting. So we tested that thermally as well because it is a, a very unique use case and one which deserves notice. The Overall build quality, the layout, the design of the case, it will leave a lot of the aesthetics to your own personal take. But from a design standpoint, thermals are actually not that bad. Despite the front panel looking like they're pretty bad, there's enough of a gap here, and the bottlenecks are actually elsewhere, not the front panel. The bottleneck is primarily in the dust filter or the fans, depending on how you look at it. Either you look at it as the dust filter is too restrictive and impeding intake, or the fans don't have enough static pressure to pull through the filter rather than maybe push, for example, through a filter. And so that's a potential design challenge as well that Fantex faces. But we'll talk about the thermals momentarily. They're overall far better than we expected, which is saying a lot, honestly. The Evolve X, looking at it, we thought it would be very bad thermally, but it did okay. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, even for the Mini ITX dual system thermals, it was not too bad. For design elements we don't like, talked about some we do like, let's talk about some we don't like. Fantex is still going with the weird Halo 1 plasma gun plasticky design they have where it's trying to look futuristic in ways that it really doesn't look futuristic. And they've done this before. For example, this sliding plate on top of the power supply shroud. Just why? It doesn't look good. It's like it's one of the only things that's plastic and it has no real functional purpose. There are more sliding plates in here in the drive cages. The case doesn't include two and a half inch drive sleds where it really should, uh, even though they support them, you have to buy them separately. And this is something that Fantex likes to do where they sell stuff that we think are basically necessities as separate items. And you can't say that it's saving you money by not including it because it's $200 or $465 with the combo for the power supply. So anyway, there should be included sleds here but they're not included. Instead, you work with these panels, and these are interesting. We'll give them credit for this interesting uh, kale management design. It's very easy to work with, easier to work with than some of Cooler Masters, but when you mount the SSDs in this drive area, it's very easy to pinch the SSD connectors, something that we've seen in other cases before, and one which is potentially bad for your SSD if it rips the connector out. We actually had that happen on an old Rosewell case that had a similar design approach. So interesting door, but not well executed really. And, uh, and that's kind of problematic for that specific use case of having, I don't know, a drive in your system. So we really do think it should include some here and not be a, a, another DLC approach. But 
Uh, the case does do a lot of very interesting things as well, as discussed, and one of them is apparently being kind of difficult to reclose that door. There we go. Another quick interesting thing what we'll talk about in Patrick's build notes is the three slot vertical GPU mount. So it allows you to space the video card a bit further away from the panel than typically, and that is something that should be good as you'll see in the thermal section. If you have a two and a half or 2.75 slot card, probably still don't use it though. And then also, the uh, if you wanted to have a top system with a riser, you could route it to this slot and run your video out there or a capture card there. Unfortunately, at $465, they're not including the riser cable. You have to buy that separately as well. So it might be easier to just use an IGP system at the top, which is what we did for our testing. But let's go through Patrick's notes and then the thermal testing data. Getting into the case is easy enough. The side panels hinge outwards from the front, but they clip shut behind the front panel. Four thumb screws can be put through the panels to hold them more securely, but we'd recommend leaving them out unless the system is being moved. Otherwise, the front panel must be first removed in order to take the screws out. The hinges work well. The doors swing a full 180 degrees and lifting the doors off of their pins is easy. We would like to see more hinges like the View 71s where the pins are of unequal height so that they can be lined up and inserted one at a time. Like the C700M, the Evolve X has a very easily removable front panel with spring-loaded pins connecting the built-in LED strips. So this is a good move for cable management. The default LED patterns are smooth and unobnoxious enough to be usable, but they also accept a DRGB control, or 3-pin, 5-volt. The cables are tucked away and clutter isn't too bad. In fact, the factory cable management was a little overzealous, as the power button cable had been stretched too tight and unplugged when we received the case. Cable management in general is good thanks to the built-in Velcro straps and hinged metal cable covers. There are also sliding plastic shields that can cover unoccupied cable cutouts, but these aren't especially useful and are more just kind of extra plastic that sounds nice in marketing and doesn't really do a whole lot. Fantex is big on extras and features, some more useful than others. One pleasant surprise was the plastic box with various screws already sorted out in it. There's also an airflow cover, quote unquote, anyway, that we didn't get a chance to test, but which is designed to block air from recirculating through unoccupied fan mounts, something we experimented with in the BitPhoenix Enzo. There's actually definitely validity to this idea, and so it might be worth using if you do end up with a sort of circular air path. The vertical GPU mount isn't anything new here, but it's three slots wide on the Evolve X rather than the usual two. That means either GPUs that take up more than two slots can be mounted vertically, bad idea, or GPUs that take up two or fewer slots can be mounted vertically with actually decent clearance from the side panel. Pretty good idea. So this is something that you should be using if you want to go vertical GPU, and we'll show you why in the thermal section. The top radiator and fan mount is removable, which is always a nice and good feature, but we'd like to see a similar removable mount in the front of the case as well. There is only one major fit and finish problem. The case fans have a raised rim at the end of each blade, and one was wedged tightly into the front fan mount when it first arrived. Fixing it required slightly loosening the fan screws, or else it was impossible for the fans to rotate. Part of the problem is that the front fan mount is made of thin, flexible pieces of metal that can buckle inwards towards the fans. The fans are plugged into a hub by default. The hub can either run the fans at full speed or accept PWM control, but there are no other buttons or sliders to control speed. Ada reported the top fan speed as roughly 1200 RPM, regardless of whether they were attached to the hub or directly to the motherboard. The ITX bracket was easier to work with than most of the small form factor cases we've reviewed. It's just a metal frame with a power button that screws into the motherboard. This, in turn, can be inserted into the upper rear of the main case and attached to the top fan or radiator mount. Unfortunately, the mini ITX frame clamps the radiator mount to the chassis. It'd be more convenient if it were possible to just screw the ITX system on like a radiator and then pop it in or out of the case. So this is overall an okay implementation, but one which definitely has avenues for improvement. It's not bad, it's just it could be more convenient and it wouldn't be that difficult to make it more convenient. Moving on to thermals and noise, and as always, check the link in the description below for the article on this with more information on how we tested. We did two torture passes rather than the normal one just to verify our baseline results because this is a more complicated case than normally. For simplicity's sake, we're listing the first run. They were within margin of error of each other and validated. We also tested with a vertical GPU in the two slots closest to the motherboard. We did another test without the front panel, 
We did one without the front panel or the filter, and we also did some dual system testing by running Firestrike on the main system and streaming it with the secondary one. It isn't directly comparable to other cases, but it is comparable to the regular Firestrike results for this case. We'll talk about the dual system thermals towards the end. As usual, we're starting with the CPU torture testing. We'll start with just the fan text results and then move on to comparative data. CPU temperature averaged 51.2 degrees Celsius delta T over ambience in torture testing for baseline. Taking the front panel off had no significant impact on the delta and landed us at 51.9 degrees over ambient. That's within margin of error of the baseline and so is functionally the same. For its relatively low pressure fans, Fantex is getting sufficient airflow around the front panel. This would likely become more of an issue with higher pressure fans, and as you'll see in a second, the filter can help validate some of this. Despite appearances of a choked front, Fantex has done a good job of spacing the front panel away from the intake fans enough and leaving wide gaps for airflow. Removing the filter as well as the front panel did lower CPU temperature down to 45.3 degrees though, revealing the real bottleneck. The dust filter heavily impedes airflow, which is a mixture of stock fans with low static pressure performance and the filter itself. Mounting the GPU vertically raised the CPU temperature slightly, up to 52.7 degrees delta T over ambient, but that could be a good sign since we sometimes see CPU temperatures drop when the GPU is being suffocated in a vertical mount. We'll show the other half of this result in a moment. Comparatively, 51.2 degrees over ambient puts the Evolve X in the CPU temperature range of the stock half X or the C700M with its front cover removed. That's respectable company to be in and is a bit better than the center of the pack. The straight front to back airflow pattern between the upper intake fan and the rear exhaust fan provides benefits for our CPU cooler, which sits exactly between them. Other nearby cases that did well include the H500 non-P mesh case at $100, operating at 49.9 degrees. We previously praised this one as a good mix of value and performance. For clarity, that's the H500 space mesh, not the H500P mesh, nor the H500M, and definitely not the NZXT H500. Hopefully the editors figure out which one we're talking about. The H700i is similarly priced, or cheaper if you go for the H700 non-i, and ends up a couple degrees warmer than the Evolve X. The H500P mesh, get that right, the, the H500P space mesh operates at an advantage 48 degrees over ambient and is also similarly priced. GPU torture temperatures are next for the Evolve X. Stock GPU temperature is 53 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient on average. It was more responsive than the CPU to removing the front panel and dropped down to 49.8 degrees over ambient and dropped further with the filter removed, down to 48.4 degrees delta T over ambient. The vertical GPU test was also a bit cooler than the baseline test, which is truly impressive given how many times we've seen GPUs break 60 degrees Celsius DT when mounted vertically, often entering throttle territory pretty hard. Fantex has provided enough clearance with the side panel and the CPU cooler that, for once, it may not be a terrible idea to use vertical mounting with an air-cooled card, as long as it's in the slots closest to the motherboard. If you were to mount this in the slots closer to the panel, or to use a 2.7 slot RTX card, it would definitely be a problem just like normally, so be careful with that. GB torture temperatures for the Evolve X, comparatively, are up next. The Corsair 270R and Thermaltake Core P3 are comparable in terms of GPU cooling. The P3 is open but has no fans, and the 270R only comes with two 120mm fans, but they're both average performers. As for cases priced similarly to the non-combo Evolve X, about 200 bucks, the H500P mesh operates a GPU temperature of 52.2 degrees over ambient, and the H700i ends up at around 52.5 degrees. These are similar in performance to the Evolve X's 53 degree stock temperature result, there's a steady supply of air along the bottom of the case from the lower intake, but it's not quite as direct as with the CPU. 3 Mark GPU temperature was 55.6 degrees Celsius over ambient on average, with an accompanying CPU DT of 25.7 degrees Celsius. That's the same as the Silverstone PM02, an average to below average case that suffers heavily in comparison to the PM01. The Evolve X ends up around where the H500M performs with the glass installed, and that's a similarly priced case, or around the C700P, also sort of similarly priced. The H500 mesh runs at 51.5 degrees and is toward the top end of the chart for something expensive that is also cooler. Both the CPU and GPU results are important to note this time since 
are the baseline temperatures for our dual system test coming up. Here's the test everyone's been waiting for, a dual system build in the same box testing thermals in a real world use case. This isn't just a torture test, we actually used it like we think you probably would. As a reminder, we used an i5-8400 as a stream capture CPU with OBS set to 12 megabits per second and faster. Realistically, we'd recommend an R5 1600 or 2600 for most builds kind of like this, but that requires some sort of display out as well, which is both more complicated and increases the thermal potential issues. The i5-8400 is still perfectly capable for an encoding system for a live stream and also has an IGP, so you don't need an additional video card in there to handle the video out or other simple tasks that really don't deserve an, a whole component taking up more space in the bottom of the case. Anyway, this isn't a build guide. It's just a CPU to generate some heat. For our lower system, we used Firestrike Extreme on loop and then captured its output with the top system. The stream test with two systems installed resulted in a lower GPU temperature than the ATX only test. The new result is 52.6 degrees over ambient for the system running Firestrike with capture, actually slightly lower than the stock 55.6 degree Firestrike test originally. There's a good reason for this. With a new gap in the rear of the case and an additional CPU cooler exhausting some air out of it, more GPU exhaust was drawn upwards. This helps reduce radiative heat trappage near the backside of the GPU, which causes our two degree delta. This is reflected in the 33.3 .3 degree CPU temperature of the Firestrike system, which is much higher than the original CPU temperature of 25.7 degrees. So this is strictly an airflow path and pressure system that's changing the results you're seeing here. All that extra heat from the top CPU has to go somewhere. It's not going to be just cooler everywhere. And the extra heat in this instance is getting pulled through the primary CPU socket area. The mini ITX system was responsible only for streaming the output from the ATX system using an external capture card. An internal capture card or secondary GPU for video out would increase temperature accordingly, of course, from both using more space and generating more heat in terms of watts used within the system. We recorded thermal data for both systems, but the hard numbers here are of limited use without anything to compare them to. The main takeaway is that it's not as much of a thermal hotbox as we might have expected, which is partly thanks to modern CPUs drawing lower power, like the i5-8400. We used a low profile cooler on our mini ITX streaming system because the CPU cooler of the main system was in the way, and that's likely the approach most users will take. That ended up at around 53 degrees over ambient, which is definitely getting warm. It worked fine using the smaller system exclusively for streaming, but any additional load or overclocking would push the limits of such a small cooler. Regardless of how good or bad the results are, it's hard not to think about how much better the thermals would get just by taking the secondary system out of the case and running it on the desk beside it. But that would require space to permit this build, and that's a big point here, but it would be probably cheaper, almost certainly, than spending $465 on a case and power supply combo because you're paying a lot for that 80 plus platinum power supply. Rendering on the CPU brought the Evolve X's CPU temperature to 37.9 degrees over ambient between the Landcool 1 and the 500D, and still almost exactly in the middle of the chart. Rendering on the GPU brought GPU DT to 26.4. That's about the same in terms of chart positioning, but between two all glass cases, this time the U71 and the Alpha 550. For the standard single system test bench for noise levels, we measured the noise level to be 41.9 dBA at max fan speed, which is loud relative to the other cases on this chart. Although the glass panels have rubber seals along the edges, there's not much obstructing noise from coming from the front case fans. The case fans don't need to run at maximum RPM all the time, but keep in mind that they will unless the fan hub is connected to a motherboard header and you set a decent fan profile that doesn't choke the air too much. That's the case. That's the Fantex Evolve X. It is absolutely not alone in the $200 price class. There are a lot of $200 cases, some of them pretty damn competitive. So just to go through the list again, at 150 to maybe 300 or so, you've got things like the H500P mesh. We received it very positively. We liked that one. It was the follow-up to the original H500P and did a great job overall at improving. You have the H500M. If you prefer the same design, just a bit fancier, it's kind of more direct competitor to this. The Be Quiet Dark Base or Dark Dark Base 900 Pro. That's it, DBP 900. Uh, Dark, Dark Base Pro 900. Whatever it is, it's got three words and then a number. That's the uh, the next 200 to 250 dollar case. That's in the same kind of competition, but it's bigger. So that's a consideration as well. 
If you wanted more large alternatives, there's the View 71 or View 71 RGB editions, about the same price. The NZXT H700 Dumb Edition or H700i is about the same price. There's the CMC 700P. There are a lot of cases at this price point. That's that's kind of the point. So you have plenty of options to choose from. We've reviewed most of them. They're in the charts if you care about thermals. We've talked about build quality if you care about that. None of those alternatives really do quite what this does, which is the two-in-one build option with the integrated power supply that splits power as opposed to doing two power supplies, which you could do. You could do it in the Lian Li O11 Dynamic, which is like 100 bucks, but that's two power supplies, so it's a completely different approach. That said, it's probably cheaper to do two power supplies, if we're being honest. It's just, it's a different approach to building. So there's nothing wrong with either one. You're just, you're really not saving money by doing this. But this isn't about saving money at nearly $500 for the combo version. That's, I mean, that's, that's an RTX 2070 at that price. So if you want it, I mean, it's pretty unique. The case overall is fine. We do have some, some fundamental problems with some of the design approach discussed earlier. Thermals are actually pretty okay. They were surprisingly decent. The fans could use a static pressure improvement. They're weak in that department, but not terrible. And overall, uh, it's reasonably competitive. And it does something that most of the other cases that do compete with it don't, which is the two system thing. So if you want that, it seems fine. So overall, this case is fine. The build quality is quite good in general, uh, notwithstanding a few of the plastic elements, but the build quality is fine. The power supply is good. The dual system integration has ways to improve, but it's pretty good overall. And the thermals are far better than we expected. So it's, it's really not a bad case. The case has received probably more praise than it deserves. It's been a bit overhyped. But uh, now that you've seen this, you hopefully know exactly what you're getting in for. We don't have any major gripes with it. There are things that it does well, things that it does kind of mediocre. Uh, so yeah, plenty of other options. If you want a single ATX system, we went through them for you. But this also competes that category. So hopefully you can sort it out between all those options and all the discussion. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Or more importantly, go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our new limited edition graph logo foil shirts, which has a quad foil design. We, we upped it a bit from the previous one, and it will, once it's gone, it'll be gone. So check that out on the store. Thank you for watching, and thank you, Chris, for the loaner. We'll see you all next time.